I lived in Brooklyn for a while. Mike is the one of the greatest men I've ever met. I'm so proud he came to speak to us. He doesn't make a lot of personal appearances, but check his website out after you hear what he says. And with that, I want to introduce to you the world's most interesting man, Mike Cutler. <laughs> Great to join you. Thanks for being here. And with an introduction like that, wow. <laughs> Thank you, John. <clears throat> Let me just give you a quick thumbnail sketch about who I am, why I'm here, and what this is really about. Um, I started working for what was the Immigration and Naturalization Service a long time ago, October 1971. I began as an immigration inspector at Kennedy Airport, did that job for about four years. For one of the four years, I was assigned to the um, division within immigration back then that adjudicated applications based on marriage to U.S. citizens. We've seen it in the movies. They do the interview. Um, it ultimately led to taking down several marriage fraud rings, the successful arrest and prosecution of an immigration lawyer. Uh, I kid you not, this guy <clears throat> was Chinese-American. He was arranging marriages between Chinese uh, seamen who had jumped ship and Puerto Rican lesbian hookers. If you could imagine the worst scenario, <laughs> I, I can't. <clears throat> Ultimately, the attorney was disbarred. It represented the very first time that I went uh, as a witness or that I served as a witness in a criminal tri trial, but there were many that followed subsequently. In 1975, I became what used to be known as a criminal investigator. The job today is known as a special agent. Uh, in 1976, by dumb luck, and playing a hunch, which I've always done. Uh, we tripped over a plot to blow up an Israeli oil refinery, the PLO. We prevented the attack, thank God. And from that day on, I had a wonderful working relationship with the Israeli National Police. It lasted the balance of my career. Um, I rotated through every squad, every division within the investigations branch. In 1988, I was the first INS agent assigned to the Unified Intelligence Division of DEA in New York. 1991, I was promoted to the position of senior special agent assigned to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. In the early 80s, because I was frustrated, and when I get frustrated, I take action. It's not enough to be frustrated. Do something about it. Uh, I went to Senator D'Amato because it was almost impossible to get the U.S. attorney to prosecute aliens who had been deported and came back illegally. And it really made sense. And we're going to talk about prosecutorial discretion uh, in this instance as a as opposed to what I've come to call Obama's prosecutorial deception when I wrote an article for the Fox News Latino website. But if you go to the U.S. attorney in a place like New York and you have an illegal alien working on a farm, working in a factory who's been deported three times, they don't want to prosecute the guy. And the reason they don't is because they have limited resources. And the attitude was, look, the worst the guy is facing is two years in jail. By the time we get done, this guy's going to get time served anyway. <clears throat> so they wouldn't prosecute. You really had to go in with a compelling case. The guy had committed a, an armed robbery. He stabbed somebody. He shot somebody. So now they were willing to look at the reentry charge. I went to Senator D'Amato with a proposition. I said, Senator, what we need to do is change the law and have a special category for criminal aliens. Two years in jail is fine for a dishwasher or a guy working in a sweatshop who gets deported and comes back. But if you're a dirtbag, you ought to be looking at 20 years in jail if you come back. We want to drop a safe on these folks' heads to make it clear that the welcome mat is not out for them. That became the law of the land. And the consequence is that immigration criminal prosecutions account for more prosecutions across the country than any other set of crimes today. We also convinced Senator D'Amato to go to the Reagan White House to implement what became the institutional hearing program to conduct deportation hearings in the prisons. See, and I tell you this not because I want to tell you what I did, although I will be very honest, I'm very proud of those changes in the law. I even got to make the first arrest in New York uh, on that criminal reentry law. The guy was a Dominican drug dealer who was joking with me. We took him out of jail. He had done time for a drug uh, transaction. And he said, my ride is here. I said, yes, but the home you're going to will still be a cage. He <laughs> accused me of being a liar. I went to a sentencing. He got five years to serve. He was crying, I was laughing, and I wished him a very nice day, told him that he should make believe he was having a nice day, and I walked out of the courtroom. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. But the point of the matter is that we were able to make changes that made things better. 
and then Reagan gave us the first amnesty. And, and I don't give him a pass. And I want you to know that both parties are wrong for what's happening. <clears throat> Point of fact, I'm a lifelong registered Democrat. I'm a labor guy. My dad will always be my biggest hero. He was a construction worker. He was a plumber. During the Second World War, because of the Sullivan brothers, they wouldn't allow him to serve in the military. And he knew he needed to contribute to the war effort. So he worked in the shipyards as a pipe fitter, building the battleships, repairing the battleships. He told me about the blood that he saw on the decks of the warships that he worked on. He worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He went down to Louisiana. And because of exposure to asbestos in the shipyards and on the construction sites, plus his three-pack-a-day Chesterfield habit, um, he died of lung cancer when he was 57. I carried him off his job his last day at work. My mother was an immigrant, came here ahead of the Holocaust. I was named for my grandmother who perished in the Holocaust. And I want you to understand this because I'm not some crazy guy who says, bar the door, don't let anybody in. I went before um, demonstrations in Washington back when I was in high school and college to the White House asking then President Lyndon Johnson to go to the Russians to convince them to let Jews and other religious minorities leave Russia, come to America, go to any country that would have them, give them political asylum, and let them have freedom. It was thrilling for me as an inspector to admit refugees into the United States, to see those kids with their parents all excited they were coming to America to be free. Now we're finding out that political asylum is a device being used by terrorists to enter the United States and embed themselves in the United States. So when I speak against the way we're administering the immigration laws, it's not that I don't want America to still be that beacon of hope for the oppressed around the world, but I don't want our, the enemies of this country to see in our kindness weakness, because we've seen what this results in. On 9-11, I want you to know that the ashes from the conflagration at Ground Zero landed on my home and in part contained the remains of my neighbors. How in the world our government can forget about that blows my mind. On December 7, 1941, the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor. 3,000 people killed. Within 44 months, the United States of America, operating in concert with its allies, and some of whom were questionable, like Russia, defeated the Nazis, built fleets of ships that had never existed before, airplanes, atom bombs, whatever it took, we did it. We are, ladies and gentlemen, coming up on the 12th anniversary of 9-11. We suffered a, a pair of terrorist attacks in 1993. You may not realize it, but January 93, a guy by the name of Amil Kansi, a Pakistani national, lied on an application for political asylum and repaid our generosity and kindness by standing outside the CIA with an AK-47, killed two CIA officers, wounded three others. A month later, the first attack at the Trade Center. That was over 20 years ago. I did my first congressional hearing on May 20th, 1997, on the issue of visa fraud, immigration benefit fraud. And we are still ignoring common sense. I brought this along. I don't usually like to read when I'm in front of an audience. I think it's uh, impolite. But I, I want to read this quote, and then I'm going to tell you where it comes from. Actually, I'm going to read three quotes, so bear with me, but I think it's, these are important. It is perhaps obvious to state that terrorists cannot plan and carry out attacks in the United States if they are unable to enter the country. Yet prior to September 11, while there were efforts to enhance border security, no agency of the U.S. government thought of border security as a tool in the counterterrorism arsenal. Indeed, even after 19 hijackers demonstrated the relative ease of obtaining U.S. visas and gaining admission into the United States, border security still is not considered a cornerstone of national security policy. We believe, for reasons that we will discuss in the following pages, that it must be made one. That quote comes from the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel. Are we, ab are we abiding by that finding? You have congressmen and senators arguing if we should secure our borders? If we should secure our borders? Are you kidding me? Let me continue. Once terrorists had entered the United States, their next challenge was to find a way to remain here. Their primary method was immigration fraud. For example, Youssef and Ajaj concocted bogus political asylum stories when they arrived in the United States. Mahmoud Abu Lima involved in both the World Trade Center and landmark plots 
receive temporary residence under the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program after falsely claiming that he had picked beans in, in Florida. Finally, terrorists in the 1990s as well as the September 11th hijackers needed to find a way to stay in or embed themselves in the United States if their operational plans were to come to fruition. As already discussed, this could be accomplished legally by marrying an American citizen, achieving temporary worker status, or applying for asylum after entering. In many cases, the act of filing for an immigration benefit sufficed to permit the alien to remain in the country until the petition was adjudicated. Terrorists were free to conduct surveillance, coordinate operations, obtain and receive funding, go to school and learn English, make contacts in the United States, acquire the necessary materials, and execute an attack. Also from that same report. We are giving hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens, as you pointed out, lawful status, temporarily. We're giving them identity documents. And guess how, how thorough the interview is, folks? There is no interview. Guess how many agents are going out into the street to do investigations to determine the truthfulness? This many. This many. Meanwhile, the 9-11 Commission and their staff said this is the way the terrorists came here and killed a bunch of us. Ironically, 3,000 people killed at Pearl Harbor, 3,000 people killed on 9-11. It only took 44 months to a country that was not yet a superpower to end the problem. Here we are more than three or four times as long since 9-11, and we're having a debate a debate, a discussion, an argument, should we secure the border? This isn't about race. With my background, I could assure you I could not enforce laws if they discriminated against people by race, religion, or ethnicity. To me, that kind of conduct is un-American and unconstitutional. The immigration laws are designed to keep people out who are a problem. Title VIII, United States Code, Section 1182. You know, what John said is right. If I say something, you can find it. There's verification. I don't make wild statements. Kathleen knows that, don't you, Kathleen? Thank you. Uh, so understand the point. Title VIII, United States Code, Section 1182 is a listing of all the categories of aliens who are supposed to be excluded. That was my job for four years. Remember, I was an inspector. Aliens with dangerous communicable diseases. Aliens who suffer mental illness and are violent or sex offenders. Aliens who are convicted felons or previously deported. Aliens who are human smugglers, drug smugglers, gun runners, violent gang members, spies, terrorists, war criminals, human rights violators. They're all excludable. That's who we're supposed to keep out. And we're also supposed to keep out aliens who, if they got a job in the United States illegally, would undermine American workers, thereby depriving them of jobs, lowering wages, and worsening working conditions. Prior to the Second World War, the enforcement and administration of the immigration laws fell to the Labor Department. That's how we built the middle class, preventing the entrance of large numbers of foreign workers who would have undermined American workers. This is as much a Democrat, liberal issue as it's a conservative issue. Ladies and gentlemen, immigration is an American issue, and it is not anti-immigrant to be pro-American. <laughs> and if you're not homeless, you've all done the job of an immigration inspector. I want you to think about it. If you live in a house that has a front door, you have a lock, a peephole, and a doorbell. Yes? Why? So you can make a conscious, intelligent decision as to whether or not to permit a stranger into your home. That's what immigration is supposed to be about. It doesn't distinguish skin color, race, religion, ethnicity, none of that. It's about keeping out people who cause a problem or would cause a problem. And then people say, well, they just want to do the work Americans don't want to do, which is a lot of bunk. It's an insult to every hardworking American. There's a guy by the name of Homer Hickam who wrote a wonderful book called October Sky. Well, actually, it was the Rocket Boys and became October Sky. My son's going to correct me. I know that because he both saw the movie and read the book. <laughs> Leave it to Josh. Thank you, Josh. I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's why I bring him along. <laughs> 
Uh, there's a lot going on under that Q-tip head of yours. <laughs> I had the privilege of speaking to Homer Hickam. My parents were my biggest heroes, but next to them, my heroes were never sports figures, but were the astronauts and test pilots. I got letters from Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom. I was gonna be an aerospace engineer when I was a kid. Josh wants to be an engineer. My oldest boy is an engineer. And that's what this is all about. It's about our kids and about their future. I had the privilege of speaking with Homer Hickam because in his book, he talked about his own childhood growing up in a town called Colwood in West Virginia. His dad was a coal miner. And because of his eloquence and because of his experience, about six years ago at the terrible Sago Mine cave-in, he was invited to deliver a eulogy. And I watched the eulogy, and I will be honest with you, he brought me to tears. Because he spoke about the coal miners, and whether you're talking about coal miners or construction workers or the guys who work in steel foundries, you're talking about bedrock Americans. And you know, you give me a choice, and I know them, there's probably going to be a lawyer here, I know we have some political folks, but I'd much rather have dinner with a bunch of hard hats than a bunch of lawyers or bankers, to be honest with you. These are the guys who built America. And I work closely with lawyers, and you know that. But my point is, I, but, but if you want to look at who built America, folks, how in the world do we allow people who allege to represent us speak ill of hard-working Americans who built the country. Any time someone stands up and talks about the work an American won't do, someone needs to punch the guy's lights out. I get choked up telling this, but I carried my father off his last day of work because he was trying to support me and my mom. My mother was already dying of breast cancer at the time. You go to a construction site on a hot summer day or a freezing winter day, and you'll see those guys out there busting their tails, doing their jobs without complaining, happy they have a day at work. We have Americans working in steel foundries and coal mines. You name the job, we do it, and we do it better and harder than anybody. They just did a study where they were talking about how in Europe, the government mandates that every worker, no matter where they work, not just government workers, have to get four or five weeks of paid vacation. vacation. Do you know construction workers don't get paid vacation? So when you hear someone talk about the work Americans won't do, it's a lie and it's an insult, and we should all be offended by that. It's just that Americans expect to have an, a working wage in exchange for their labor. What a strange concept that is. Imagine expecting a living wage for your efforts. So when we hear this nonsense, and you look at Homer Hickam, who stood there at the eulogy, and the words that he said that brought tears to my eyes was when he said that there's no water holier than the sweat off a man's brow. And I want you for a moment to contrast that reverence for those hard-working Americans with politicians who have the unmitigated chutzpah to talk about the work that American won't do. And I want you to know what a terrorist does the day before he's involved in a terrorist attack. Do you know what he's doing? Going to his job where he's hiding in plain sight. Somebody once said that an effective spy or terrorist would not attract the attention of a waiter or waitress at a greasy spoon diner. In point of fact, it might well be that he or she is working as a waiter or waitress at that greasy spoon diner. I have arrested people involved with terrorism who are doing just that, including a guy who was washing dishes in the back of a diner in Staten Island. Please understand the dangers that we're facing. We have people hiring day laborers, and I could pull out newspaper article after newspaper article about day laborers who wound up raping and killing people because they were criminals in their home country. You see, when someone runs the border, we don't know why they're running the border. If God forbid you came home and found a stranger sitting in your house, the first thing we instinctively would say is, what are you doing here? Isn't that the instinctive question? What are you doing here? You know what? We will never know what they're doing here. We don't know if they're desperate for a job, and, and this isn't to, to make you know, villains out of everybody. There are some people who are truly in a desperate situation, but we can't bring the whole world here any more than if we were on a lifeboat with limited number of seats that we could take on more people that would then capsize our lifeboat. Half the world lives well below anything we would conceive of as being the poverty line. What we, thought, what we would think of as the poverty line in America would be an opulent living style for half the world. Can we bring three billion people here, folks? 
you know, sometimes you just can't do what you might want to do. And we have got to understand that we have limitations to what even America can do. And we're seeing what those limitations are when you look at where the economy is. According to CBS Radio just this morning when I was showering, they said that the average hourly wage has declined in New York by 7%. They give us this BS statistic, 7.4% unemployment. That's like the kid that comes home and says, Dad, you've got to be proud of me. I, I, I got an 85 on my test. I got an 80 on my test. This is a kid that's always flunking, and he looks at the test, and the kid got a 35. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the first question had five parts. I got four out of five right, so I got an 80 on the first question. That's the kind of crazy math they're doing for unemployment because they're not counting the people that have given up looking for work. They're not counting the people that are underemployed and making minimum wage and had to sell their house, but they're trying to still shovel food onto the table somehow. So they talk about a 7.4% unemployment rate. This is the biggest lie in the world. Bernie Madoff couldn't make these numbers up. Think about it. In some communities, the unemployment rate is running to 25 and 30 percent, but they have the chutzpah to stand there and talk about it. And they're not telling you that half the jobs they create are part-time jobs or minimum wage jobs. Lots of luck trying to raise a family on a minimum wage job. It's lie after lie. You started talking about the DREAM Act. It's unbelievable. No face-to-face -face interviews, providing opportunities for foreign students. Uh, my son Josh, to let you in on a little story, has a form of autism called Asperger's. He's a brilliant kid, and the reason that we expect him to go to college, and he just did a STEM program at City College and came in first in his class, and yes, I'm going to embarrass you, Josh. Stand up, stand up. And the secret to his success is early intervention programs that they are now slashing for American kids. I don't want to imagine where we would be if Josh didn't have access to early intervention. It made all the difference in the world. And yet we are ignoring our own children. We're being told that it's racist to enforce the immigration laws. Do you realize that the greatest levels of poverty and unemployment are in the black and Latino communities? And these are Americans we're talking about, folks. It's insulting to Latino Americans to say that if you're Latino, I guess you must be an illegal alien. Because that's the image that they're conveying. You're certainly Latino and have every right to be as proud of your ethnicity as I do of mine. Do you not sometimes wonder how you could possibly be an American? I mean, doesn't it anger you? Mm -hmm. um, and love this country, respected their you know, the laws, the customs, the norms, the language, and my dad served you know, in Korea. And, you know, so now explain, so, so how in the world do you do that? And then how do you turn around? Now, you know, we're hearing so much about racial profiling, correct? Racial profiling? So if a police officer or a federal agent sees a white kid going into a predominantly black neighborhood where we know there's been a lot of drug sales, I did a lot of surveillance, I can't tell you how many hours I logged in, in hot, sweaty surveillance vans or sitting in, in, in cars and so forth. So you see a kid go into a neighborhood, he's obviously out of his element, he's got an out-of-town tag on his nice new BMW, a presumption is maybe he's in that neighborhood to buy drugs, maybe not, but certainly he's worthy of being stopped. Proper profiling is kind of like the consumer who finds a can of soup in the, in the freezer chest when he's looking for ice cream and says, what's this doing here? But that's what it's about. Something is out of place. So it's reasonable as long as the encounter is done professionally and low key. Come on too aggressively and you're out of line. But there's nothing wrong with pulling the kid over and saying, son, let me see a license and registration. And by the way, who are you visiting at 3 o'clock in the morning? It's reasonable. When I was a kid, because my parents died when I was a youngster and I was on my own, I had bought a sports car. Um, and I used to get pulled over a lot. Why a young kid in a sports car, what's he doing? As long as the stop is handled properly, the cop is doing his job. But when you do that kind of a stop, think about it. It's a situational profile. It's not just that the kid is white or black. It's what he's driving, where he is, what hour of the day. There's a lot that goes into that decision. Let's pull that guy over. And I've been involved in a lot of discussions with a lot of cops up at the EA, at, at the FBI, and so forth. And that's what you do. Yeah, you know, that guy looks like maybe he was going to that address we're looking at. So is it reasonable to stop him? Sure. And yet the journalists go crazy. Oh, my God, profiling. Now, I'm going to ask you to think about something. You ready for this? 
Is it not an insidious form of profiling that has nothing situational at all when you could say, oh, that guy's name is Goldstein? That person's name is Rodriguez? That guy's name, we know who they're going to vote for. What kind of profiling is that? And why doesn't anybody scream bloody murder about that kind of miserable profiling? You mean all Jews vote alike? All Latinos think alike? Why don't they just say those people? It's infuriating. It's insulting. It's dehumanizing. And yet the same people that scream bloody murder about profiling are guilty of the most insidious form of profiling imaginable. And by the way, if you're talking about hurting the immigrant communities, do you know who is most at risk from the violence of transnational criminals? The members of the same ethnicity within the immigrant community. And it's not just about Latinos, it's the Russian community, the Asian community, the Jamaican community, the African communities, because the bad guys are able to pick up a phone and say, hey, Ivan over here doesn't want to play ball, pay his sister a visit tomorrow. And they do. And you know what? They go to Ivan and they say to him in Brighton Beach, is this your sister? We're going to have a party tonight. I'm sending my friends over there if you don't take the suitcase and bring it to my friend in Chicago. Well, what's in the suitcase? Hell, you don't ask questions or she dies, painfully. Take the suitcase, here's your ticket, get on the airplane. You know what they now have, folks? A courier. You know how often that plays out? Yes, okay. I'm being asked about a question and answer, and that's what I live for, because I, I think that's where we really put everything together. But what I want you folks to come away with is an understanding of what's going on. We're being told about foreign students. Do you know that right now there are 850,000 foreign students in the United States? 10,000 schools authorized to uh, petition for foreign students. There is no integrity to the process. In 2006, the Washington Post ran an article about how citizenship and immigration services claimed to have lost 111,000 immigration files and naturalized 30,000 aliens without their files. Three weeks ago, the story was that they lost track of a million non-immigrant visitors. We're being told about securing the Mexican border. How many border states do we have? Anybody have an estimate? Four. How many, uh, anybody else have a guess? Canada. Keep going. I feel like an auctioneer. I need the gavel. How about 50? How about 50? 50, and I'll tell you why. Any state that has a seaport or an international airport, ladies and gentlemen, is a border state. Any state with a seaport or an international airport is as much a border state as are the Canadian border or the states on the Mexican border. We have over 5 million, and I've been told by some of my friends that work at DHS, you all know what DHS stands for? The Department of Homeland Surrender, is that right? <laughs> they tell me it may be as many as 10 million visa violators in the United States. The terrorists who attacked us on 9-11 were all violating the, the immigration laws by being here. They didn't run the border. So we're being told, oh, four border states, that's done for two reasons. So everybody that was living in, in New York and Chicago and, and Philly, oh, I'm not in Texas, their problem, okay? And by the way, when people run the border, they don't come the way that Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. They're not looking to plant their boots on our side of the border, plant the flag, grab some rocks, and go home. They're headed for the rest of the country. And it's lowering wages. It's undermining America's workers. We have day laborers doing the jobs that used to be done by skilled tradesmen like my dad and his buddies. You cannot compare the work of a tradesman with a day laborer. And you're letting people into your home whose backgrounds are unknown and unknowable. The terrorists in the aggregate used over 300 false names. They want to provide driver's licenses for illegal aliens. It's about voting. It's about getting cheap labor. It's about the Chamber of Commerce making unbelievable campaign contributions. Now, some of the local chambers aren't bad, but on a national level, I call them the Chamber of Horrors. They are pushing to expand the number of visa waiver countries. We now have 37 visa waiver countries. The visa requirement provides an important layer of security. On 9-11, there were either 26 or 27 visa waiver countries. We've added at least 10 countries to that list to satisfy the Chamber of Commerce because they've created a program known as the Discover America Partnership. Someone needs to remind them that Al-Qaeda has already discovered America. We just shut down embassies 
out of fear that al-Qaeda might attack. There's concern that if we act against Syria, that there may be terrorist attacks in the United States. What you may not know is that each and every week there are direct flights coming from Tehran, Iran, into Caracas, Venezuela, carrying Iranian shock troops, the same kind of cuds as they're known in Iran, as tried to carry out an assassination in Washington, D.C. Okay? We also have terror training camps in the tri-border region of Brazil. Now, I want to be very clear. I have no problem with anybody practicing any religion. I don't care if you get peace of mind by standing on your head and yodeling. Just keep it down when it's after 10 o'clock at night so we can get a night's sleep. I have no problem with people practicing Islam. However, if you believe that in the name of whatever religion you subscribe to, you have a green light to do harm to me or anybody else, you are a problem. And we have got to be careful who we are letting into our home just the way. And you know what's funny? I'll just tell you this, and then I'll take questions, and that will usually get us going in another direction. But if you want to talk about a disconnect, I want you to think about my pet punching bag, Bloomberg. <laughs> and I voted from the first two times. This was the guy who said that, that it would be disgusting to run for a third time, and he proved what I've always known about him. He's disgusting. But... <laughs> You know, Bloomberg runs around talking about salt and sugar. You know, he's on this health kick. He, he has a Jewish mother complex. But you never hear him talk about the other powders of heroin or cocaine. And I'll tell you why he's concerned about sugar and salt. First of all, it makes him look nice to so many gullible people. And if you wonder how gullible we are, just remember that they not only made money with the pet rock, but a few years later with the training manual for the pet rock. Maybe that's how we wound up with the Congress that we have. But Bloomberg understands something else. If you're healthy, you're probably going to live longer and keep making more payments into your life insurance plan before you check out. If you're healthy, you may not need to go to a doctor or a hospital saving his friends in the insurance business money. So this is about money. See? Now, heroin and cocaine do far more damage. It's estimated 70% of the crime in the United States, directly and indirectly related to the drug trade. But there's so much money in it. I believe if we took the drug money out of the economy, it would implode like a black hole. The documentary you need to see is called Co Cocaine Cowboys, about what happened in Miami, late 70s, early 80s, where the rest of the economy was in an economic doldrum, believe it or not. The economy of uh, Miami was through the roof all drug money. So I guess Bloomberg has, you know, look, he looks at his fellow New Yorkers the way a turkey farmer looks at his flock. I'm just surprised he doesn't run around throwing corn at us. But Bloomberg made a big speech and made a big stink about the fact that we have trespassers in the public housing projects. And he said, it's unsafe to have trespassers. You don't know who they are or why they're here. I want the district attorney to prosecute every pr trespasser that walks into our housing projects. Last week, he said, I'm upping the ante. I want them all fingerprinted. If you're going to live in the project, we need to know who you are until you get to illegal aliens, and then suddenly he doesn't care about trespassing on America. Alan Greenspan made a statement. I'm going to leave you with that, and then I hope I have a lot of good questions. I know this is a bright audience, and I know you guys are motivated. Greenspan testified for Chuck Schumer at a hearing on April 30th, 2009. I was so angry, I was on a radio show the next day. The host, the young lady who I was on with, said, what did you think of Greenspan when you watched the hearing? I said, I was struck by the idea of witnessing a first. She said, what kind of first? I said, it was the first time I'd ever seen somebody testifying while suffering from rigor mortis. So, Greenspan actually talked about the need to greatly reduce inequality in wages. Interesting choice of language. But not based on race, religion, ethnicity, gender. I would agree with it. Inequality based on skill. He referred to Americans with skill as the privileged elite. I called my son Seth up. I said, Seth, congratulations. You have a new title. Forget engineer. You're part of the privileged elite. And he said that they were earning a wage premium that we could deal with if we could open up the quotas and force them to accept wages based on the wage pricing mechanism of world competition. He also said that by bringing in lots more people, we could have them occupy the now vacated housing units. Those were his words. I have it right here, housing unit. Housing, these are people's homes that were lost to foreclosure. And then a few years earlier, when he went before the Federal Reserve Bank as the, uh, as the uh, chairman of the Fed, he talked about how great it was that he was providing subprime mortgages for aliens. 
We have no idea who we gave mortgages to. We have no idea who we're letting into the country. And John, I don't think that we're dealing with 20 million. I think we're dealing with at least 30 million illegals in this country. In, in 86, we were told a million to a million and a half would come out of the shadows. We wound up instead with almost four million. Do the math. And so when they tell us they're gonna make these folks go through a background check, that's worthless. Because if their fingerprints aren't on file and they use a BS name, it's gonna come back no record, okay? They're saying we're gonna get them out of the shadows. The only people you're getting out of the shadows are those people that believe they have a good chance of not being discovered for what they are. The people that know that they have a rap sheet from here to that wall, they're not coming out of the shadows. And you know what? We're not gonna look for them either. My website, by the way, is michaelcutler.net. Write it down. You can contact me through it. It's on I also, our website uh, also at the well, bottom. You, can, you have it. Yes, we have it on our website also at the bottom. And you can reach out to me. And if you become aware of other speaking opportunities, I am determined since 9-11 uh, to get the message out there. I was actually uh, fired. We got it fixed after I testified at a hearing without the authority of my agency. Um, and one of the hearings I've done, I think we're up to 16 congressional hearings. Do you all remember, or do any of you remember, when two of the dead terrorists got permission to attend flight school six months after the attacks? Yeah. yeah. I was, remember there was a congressional hearing? I, I was one of the four witnesses called by the House Judiciary Committee. This isn't speculation, folks. What I'm giving you is the benefit of 30 years on the job. Uh, by the way, if you really want to know if the border is secure, you want the real metric, I told this to Neil Cavuto last week when I was in studio with him, the real metric isn't border patrol arrests. That's like a taking attendance by asking people not present to raise their hand. <laughs> it doesn't work. <clears throat> the price of drugs. The same border that provides access to the illegals provides access for the narcotics. If the border was secure, drugs would be unavailable, economics kicks in, the price would go through the roof. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened because the border is nothing more than a speed bump. Nothing more than a speed bump. We are providing transnational gangs. It's now hundreds of cities are infested by the Mexican cartels. Uh, I'm going to be with Lou Barletta, formerly the mayor of Hazleton. We are going to be in uh, Daytona Beach, Florida at Embry-Riddle University on Tuesday. C-SPAN is covering it, I was told. Uh, and we're going to be discussing the immigration issue. I'm going to be there with radio station WNDB, Mark Bernier's program. I've been on with Mark forever. Uh, and we're going to be discussing these issues. This is not about being against people. This isn't about xenophobia. This is simply about doing what we've told our children. Be careful who you open the door to. Right. Be careful that we don't pre bring people in that will undermine American wages and American jobs. Um, as the 9-11 the Commission said, if we could have kept these people out of the country, the attacks couldn't have happened. I hope that I've given you some insight that maybe you haven't had, and I'd love to have questions. So have at it. Yes. Thank you. Mike. Oh. allowed um, to the entitlements. There would be no welfare benefits. They could not be, and they quickly said they couldn't have Obamacare. I guess they got a, like a waiver from it. But which makes me think, well, the American worker is being shifted to part-time their employers to avoid Obamacare. Who's going to get those jobs? All right. Let me tell you what. First of all, let me show you what kind of a magic act we're dealing with. Pardon me. <coughs> they have all these categories of aliens who are supposed to be kept out, and you go to the very next section of law, and you know what's on the next section of law? All the waivers for the grounds of exclusion. Okay, now think about that. That's the magic act of trying to be in two places at one time. It only works in quantum physics, not in the real world, and Washington, okay? So let me, let me give you the mythology they're giving you. We're going to put them on the back of the line for citizenship. We all heard that, the back of the line? How many of these folks want citizenship? None. They don't. They want to work. They don't need to. How quickly do they get permission to work under their program? Day Immediately. Day Immediately. Day How soon can they travel? Immediately. How soon can they bring their families in under this program? Immediately. Citizenship? By the way, something to think about. 
Um, do you realize that right now, we are admitting more foreign workers into America than the number of new jobs we're creating? Let me tell you how we make that, how I come up with the numbers, and you make your own decision. We are admitting over a million lawful immigrants every year. They have green cards. They're on the path to citizenship. You know, they said, we need a fair way to get to citizenship. We have it. It's the naturalization process. We admit more lawful immigrants than the rest of the world combined. Right now. Right now, without any change in the law. So we're admitting about 100, close to 100,000 lawful immigrants every month. Yes, I know someone's going to say, but they're children, and they are. But God willing, they get to grow up, and then they, they join the labor pool also. So they're either workers or will be workers. We are admitting over 400,000 foreign students every year. They get permission to work. It's called practical training. We're admitting hundreds of thousands of foreign exchange visitors to do tough jobs Americans won't do. You want to know some of the jobs the exchange visitors do? And this is from Ireland, mostly, because of our friend Ted Kennedy, who, by the way, turned his back on me when I went to shake his hand when I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm pleased to tell you he won't do that again. <laughs> I'm bad. <laughs> I've never had that happen before. Sheila Jackson Lee invited me to testify not only at the hearing about the dead terrorists, but at a follow-up hearing about alien smuggling. And when she sees me, she hugs me. And I may disagree with her, but we're Americans. And by the way, that is our birthright. And I, and I want to make this point. I'm glad I thought to say this to you. I bet everybody here considers himself or herself a conservative, more or less, kind of, sort of. I'm a Democrat. So what? We're Americans. We have got to stop allowing our enemies to play this game of divide and conquer, and you've got to split immigration off from all the other issues. Do you know how important immigration is? I spoke before a bunch of Air Force generals and colonels in Washington. I work with the Speaker's Bureau that holds seminars for the military and the intelligence services. And I like to fire people up. I say, you know, if you're going to get in front of an audience, don't be accused of being an unlicensed anesthesiologist. Keep it interesting. <laughs> So these guys were a little bit tired, too much food, you know, the bellies were. And I'm in front of this room, 80 of these guys, all looking like they wanted to rip someone's head off. And I said, why do we still have a military? And then I ducked, because, you know, you could imagine the reaction. I said, here's the deal. I'm a big fan of the military. My dad's brother, by the way, served in the Army Air Corps, and it was because of him that my dad couldn't get into the military because of the Sullivan brothers. But I said, isn't it true that every branch of the military has one mission, really? primary mission, to keep America's enemies as far from our shores as possible. True or false? True. Well, I had a bunch of bobbleheads. I said, okay, how do you carry out your mission when we have tens of millions of people in this country without any way of knowing who they are or why they're here? It's not just from Mexico. They are here from everywhere. 30% of the people arrested around the country for drug trafficking by the DEA are foreign born. In New York, when I was assigned to DEA intelligence, I decided to do some number crunching. Do you know that in 1989, 60%, 60% of the people we were arresting at DEA were foreign born? I mean, this is the magnitude of the problem. Think of what just 19 terrorists did to us on 9 11. They said, How in the world do you carry out your primary mission? One of the generals came up to me afterwards. He said, You know, Mr. Cutler, you just screwed up my dinner plans. I was going to take my wife to dinner and a movie. She's not going to be happy with you or me. But after what you told me, and I'm sorry I didn't even think of this before because we've all been bamboozled, he said, I'm going to sit home tonight and write letters to Congress. He said, I never, ever thought of immigration in those terms. See, a country's borders are her first line of defense and her last line of defense. And I don't care if that border exists at Kennedy International Airport or up in the, the northern border, the southern border, or, or Miami seaport. Think back to what they said here. You've got to be able to keep them out of the country. So it's, it's lie after lie. The end of the line, big deal. They don't care. We're going to give them documents that are tamper-proof. Nothing is tamper-proof. Tamper-resistant. It's like a bulletproof vest. Bullet-resistant, and you pray that they don't that they hit you in, in, where the Kevlar is, if God forbid you do get shot. But who, what name do you put on those documents if these people are undocumented? We don't even know what country they're from. We're being told that it's got to meet the needs of the workers. You know, we're hearing that if we don't bring in foreign entrepreneurs, we're screwed, right? We've heard that. 
Now, who told us that? Bill Gates. Where was Bill Gates born? Yeah. Where was Zuckerberg born? Okay. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Elon Musk. You know his name? Yes, yes. Started PayPal, SpaceX, mm -hmm. Tesla. Okay, he was born in South Africa. Guess what? We gave him a green card. So what is it that we're trying to fix? What are we fixing? This is about lowering wages. Funny story, I, I, I got a limo ride when I go to Fox News. They don't, they don't pay you for it. I'm still trying to twist their arm and convince them I need to be a contributor. But they do send a limousine and they have a nosh waiting for me. And being a Brooklyn, Jewish kid from Brooklyn, I like my nosh. <laughs> but this guy was from India originally. He says to me, you know how angry I am? I call the bank and I'm calling home. <laughs> True story. Another day I took a limo ride in and the guy was from China. He said if America was 15 years ago what it is today, I wouldn't have come. Wow. Now understand, these are people who legally immigrated. And they're saying, why did I come? Why did I come? It is not anti-immigrant to be pro-American. You know, it was Jimmy Carter who started this BS that we couldn't use the word illegal alien. He was very smart. He wanted to make everybody an immigrant, so then if you take my position, you're anti-immigrant. I got so angry because they threatened us with severe discipline. If we dared use the word illegal alien, I started to call them pre-citizens and it caught on. So one day I get a phone call from a border patrol agent from Yuba, Arizona. I need an immigration file on one of them pre-citizens, and I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> By the way, do you know what the definition of alien is? Any person, not a citizen or national of the United States. If you can tell me, if you can tell me where the insult is in that definition, I'll buy you dinner. Where is the insult to saying you're not a citizen if you're not a citizen? That's all it means. It doesn't mean you're ugly, you smell bad, or you're stupid. It just means you're not a citizen. Okay. So when we go to Canada, guess what? You don't need a flying saucer. You become an alien just by virtue of crossing that border. So why is this a big deal? When I went on one program, uh, one of the young ladies that I was with, an actress, said, oh, the border is an imaginary line. Well, she has an estate, a mansion, okay? She makes lots of money, makes movies. Good. I'm happy. That's the American dream. I'm all for it. Do you think when they did a survey on her land so they could build her mansion, she said, oh, that line's imaginary? <laughs> I don't think that was an imaginary line. So how did the border of the United States become imaginary? And I want you to think about how many battles, bloody battles, have been fought over every damn border on the map. When you study geography, how are we taught geography? What country borders on the other country? Borders are not unlike the locks of a canal. I said this one day to the chief counsel for the immigration subcommittee. We're having a discussion over lunch. He said, I never thought of it that way. I said, but it's true. We're not all at the same level. That's why you need borders, whether it's about freedom, whether it's about economic opportunity. When the day comes that everybody's at the same level 500 years from now, if we ever get there and we don't blow ourselves up, then maybe they could have this conversation. But when you look at rampant poverty and disease, when you look at lack of education, when you look at dictatorships and the threats posed by transnational gangs and international terrorists, our borders, ladies and gentlemen, have never been more important than they are today. Another question. Oh, all right. You, oh, I, you I, had, and then you. I had a quick question, Mike. Um, you know, we're talking about th that we're you're taking we're taking on the language of the pro open borders who you know want to immigration anarchists. Exactly. So they they're framing this. The thing is that um, you know I'd like you to touch on the fact that you know. Um, we, we have let in more immigrants than any other nation. It's about, gen, gen, we are a generous nation. A lot of people don't realize that, no, but I, again. I, I just said that. We're, we're admitting yeah. over a million a year. We're admitting in tens of millions of foreign visitors on top of, we're admitting in people entitled to work in the United States. We are admitting in probably 200,000 foreign workers legally before we even get to the illegal aliens that are working here. And, you know, they make a big stink on the news. Oh, they created 150,000 new jobs last month. Okay, and you let in 200,000 workers. We're running up and down escalator, folks. It's not working. Go to any neighborhood, and I've been all over the country, from Hawaii to California to Arizona. To neighborhoods that used to be beautiful and well-to-do are in the toilet. People can't afford to pay for the things they used to be able to pay for. It's a vicious spiral. We're going down the drain. You know, I think what's really happening is that the politicians in Washington 
are looking to Mexico as the role model for the United States rather than the other way around. There's an oligarchy in Mexico, so 1% controls 95% of the wealth, and I think that's exactly the way we're headed if we don't stop this. Yes, go ahead. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> You've convinced me that you know what you're talking about, but I have a question for you. In spite of that? In spite <laughs> of that. Yes, in spite of that. In spite of that. Do you think the fix is in? I mean, everyone, everyone, in this, everyone in this room, as you point out, is a, probably a conservative. And I would also say that everyone in this room probably called their rep or their senators, and they've done what they could. What do you think is going to happen now? Is the fix in? What can we I do? Don't, I don't think the fix is in. I okay. Think we, we, uh, uh, no, I don't. I, and, and I speak to some members of Congress directly, Careful. which is something I'm very happy about, and I, I won't tell you who, because if I do, it'll create a problem. But um, um, the people I've been speaking to believe that there is no fix in, because I, I, I ask them those questions. You know, I, I think you can tell. I, I take no prison. If I was willing to get fired over this, my dad, may rest in peace, said to me, you can tell who a real man is, he stands for something. So when I had to make the decision as to whether or not I was going to uh, go testify without permission, I was thinking about what my dad had said to me, and my, my first wife um, had died of breast cancer 27 years ago. <sighs> me too. And um, if you remember those pictures at St. Vincent's Hospital of the surgeons waiting for the victims who never showed up, that was the breaking point for me because she died there. And um, we've got to push back. Because I can't get the image out of my head of those young people jumping off the towers. I have nightmares about it. I have nightmares about it. I have nightmares of my neighbors sitting on the sidewalk in front of my house crying in the middle of the night because they didn't know where their wives, their children, or their husbands or, or, or wives were. I still have nightmares. New York still has post-traumatic stress. And the idiots in Washington, the crooks, the liars, and the thieves, uh, both political parties, I hate them all with the exceptions of the people that are willing to sit down with me and have an honest conversation. Um, I, I, wish, I wish they had listenings instead of hearings. You know, I brought something. I, oh, this I is you. kind of a, a, a down thing, and I don't want us to get into a down thing. And, and I know we have a couple of political folks here, so you're going to have to forgive me. But I came up with a list of five items about the analogy between the two oldest professions. <laughs> I, I just couldn't resist. Both professions begin with the letter P. Both involve lots of people getting screwed. In both professions, the practitioners will assume any position, no matter how ridiculous, uncomfortable, or contrary to common sense, for the right price. In prostitution, the clientele bring their fantasies the prostitute tries to fulfill. In politics, the constituents bring their concerns and the politicians respond by, prom by making promises they fulfill by creating fantasies. Yeah. STDs can give the clients of prostitutes a case of buyer's remorse or perhaps a case of something else. Well, voters may well suffer a case of buyer's remorse when they come to find out what their elected representative does once he or she is elected to office. Talk about the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the fix is in. I think we've got to be loud and, and clear about it. But I'm going to tell you, I had an argument with Mike Chertoff, who tried to convince me that immigration had nothing to do with 9-11, and I was ready to rip him a new tailpipe, and I did, actually. And it was funny, because we're in the back of this limousine, we're both speaking at Chapman Law School. And if you know of any college campuses, I love going to campuses, because I've had the protesters at demonstrations, when they heard what I had to say, come up and hug me and ask if I would pose for a photo with them because suddenly the light goes on, I'm being lied to. No one could be that dumb that long. Sooner or later, the truth seeps in, even in spite of themselves. So I was there with Hutchinson, and he's trying to tell me that. And I said, you know, uh, Hutchinson tried to distract the conversation. And he said, isn't Janet doing a great job? This is about five years ago. <laughs> Janet, yeah. I said, the woman who the morning after Captain Underpants almost brought out an airplane? I said, you should know that I wrote a commentary. And she said that the system worked. I said, I wrote a commentary where I said, if hope is not a strategy, then dumb luck is not a success. <laughs> so, Chertoff was very upset. But he said, why is it that no one on your side of the argument is, is up there making as much noise as the other side? And I said, since when do we decide on national security strategies by popular opinion poll? 
And it was a duh kind of moment. <laughs> Do you know, and, and this is what I confronted him with over lunch the next day when he spoke, and I will give him credit for calling on me because I would have thought he would have looked at my hand and would have said, get him away, you know. But no, he called on me and I said, I have a multi-choice, a multiple part question. He says, you have as many, choice, as many parts as you want, I'm gonna take them all from you, go. And you, and you need to know this. And you need to know this, because you see, as I said to Jim Sensenbrenner when I convinced him to go against George W's guest worker program, I told him, if I can't sleep at night, I don't want you sleeping at night. <laughs> so I'm, here it is. You won't need black coffee to stay up tonight. When an alien naturalizes, they can take any name they want. When they get a US passport, it only reflects their new name. They get to put, the, put, put themselves their own witness protection program. And so then, I told him that I had spoken to an inspector at a major port of entry who called me up because he couldn't sleep at night either. There's a lot of insomniacs out there. And we're always on the internet at three in the morning. It's good I have a, a power book that has an illuminated keyboard. My wife sleeps and I'm banging away on the keyboard at night. But what happened was this guy comes into a, a, a major port of entry with a US passport that says his place of birth is Beirut, Lebanon. Now, he wouldn't tell me the guy's name. My top secret clearance has expired. I didn't have a need to know. It doesn't matter. But he said he had an Anglo name. So for the sake of our conversation, let's say his name is Robert Anderson. But he didn't sound like Robert Anderson. His accent was so heavily Arabic that he couldn't understand him without asking him three times. And he looked Arabic. He had a dark complexion. And he went through the guy's passport. And he'd been traveling for four years all over Latin America, Europe, and the Middle East under the name Robert Anderson. And he said, what was your name before you naturalized, playing a hunch? Muhammad, whoever. When he ran that second name, the guy was a wanted international terrorist. Oh my God. Not on a no-fly list. That would have been bad enough. He was wanted. He called JTTF. He said that the agents from the Bureau showed up so quickly their shoes were smoking. <laughs> now, my question to Chertoff. Why in the world are we at least putting both names on the U.S. passport? Chertoff said, we're working on it. I said, Mr. Chertoff, and I told him about my analogy with the Second World War. It took 44 months to win the war. So tell me, what Manhattan Project, what quantum leap in technology is America breathlessly awaiting so we can add a second name to a U.S. passport? <laughs> Everybody gasped. I guess they weren't used to people being that forthright with him. And he stood there looking at his shoes as though he just discovered he was wearing them. <laughs> And then he looked up and said, you don't know how political this is. And I jumped up. I said, Mr. Chertoff, forgive me. You've been very generous. And by the way, he said something else that either was very flattering or very frightening. I'm still trying to decide. He said that I knew more about immigration than anyone that he had worked with when he was secretary. So I don't know if I should be flattered or scared, probably both. But I, I said to him, would you dare say that to the parents of one of those people who plummeted to their death at the Trade Center? And he got very serious, and he said, it's fortunate that you're out there with this message. Please keep doing it. He said, this isn't. <laughs> See, when my mother told me how my grandmother died in the Holocaust, she said to me, you can't ever go quietly. That's the point. We are a nation of people. We have become afraid to offend people. We're afraid to stand up for ourselves. I hate bullies. I was a scrawny kid. I used to get the crap beat out of me once a week when I was in school until my father said, you're going to go to gym. And you're going to go work out in the gym. You're going to learn how to box. And the first time I beat the snot out of somebody, I only had to do that a couple of times, and it ended. But today we're told you can't even stand up for yourself. People become apologetic when they're accused of being racist when they know they're not being racist. Why in the world do people do that? When people accuse me of racism, I rip them a new tailpipe. It's a how dare you moment. Be honest with me. Do I sound racist to any of you? I can't tell you how many horror stories I could tell you about American minorities, American immigrants of every flavor who have suffered incredibly. I've raided the hooker houses. We've done all kinds of stuff. The human suffering that our open borders creates for America and for people around the world is mind-numbing. But if you look at the people making out literally and figuratively like bandits on the immigration issue, I wrote an article for The Social Contract, and I called this a couple of months, a couple of years ago, I called it Immigration the Modern Day Gold Rush. 
This is no different from the slave trade, but what we are doing is destroying America. Uh, right here. Fight back, and by the way, this has nothing to do with any of the other so-called conservative issues. There should be as many liberals and independents in this room today. And just because I disagree with you doesn't make you my enemy. You know what it makes you? A fellow American with whom I have a disagreement. The First Amendment speaks about the right to peaceable assembly. You know why? They said have the debates, have the arguments, just leave the knives, the guns, the clubs at home and have at it. So we've got to understand that immigration should not be part of any bigger issue. It's not about school prayer, it's not about gay rights, it's not about anything, it's about immigration. And please, when you do these events, try to get, and have people come up who disagree. I was on the debating team, I've never lost a debate. I couldn't play ball, a ball if you put a gun to my head other than the handball, I'm a Brooklyn boy. But if we can't have the debates, we're not gonna win. Debates are part of the democratic process. We've got to get a fellow Americans to understand what a level of betrayal this is, how it's hurting them on a personal level. And we can bring, I think, the rest of Americans along. 